Welcome to St. Pete Decides 2013 Mayoral Candidate Forum, live from City Council Chambers on St. Pete TV. Brought to you by the University of South Florida, St. Petersburg. Good evening, and welcome to St. Pete Decides 2013. I am your moderator, Frank Biafora, Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences at the University of South Florida, St. Petersburg. Tonight, we have a chance to hear from all five of our mayoral candidates right here in the chambers of City Hall, the exact location where each hopes to serve. This forum being brought to you live on St. Pete TV may be a little bit different than other forums, and here's how it will work. The forum has three main elements. The first is a second 60 second opening statement by each candidate that will focus on his or her personal background and story. Next is a 60 second question and answer round designed to address a broad range of topics and issues <coughs> that are important to voters today. As part of this Q&A, each candidate will be offered an additional 30 second rebuttal to clarify remarks made by other candidates. Finally, each candidate will be given a chance to offer a, six, a, sorry, a 90 second closing statement. The candidates have been assigned their specific seat position by random selection, which also determines the order of the opening and closing statements. Issue questions will be posed to candidates in rotating order, providing each candidate multiple opportunities to answer first and an equal one minute opportunity for response times. Can uh, questions for this candidate forum were solicited from students and employees of USF St. Petersburg and also from the audience members tonight. Know that there are many more questions in the pool than the time will allow. With that, let's meet the candidates. On the far left, we have Anthony Cates. To his left, Rick Kreisman. To his left, Kathleen Ford. To her left, Paul and Jimmy. And to his left, the incumbent, Bill Foster. Here's an interesting fact that some of you may not know about the mayoral election. Per section 5.015A of the city charter, if a candidate for mayor receives more than 50% of the votes cast in the primary, then the candidate shall be considered duly elected and shall not be required to be placed on the general election ballot. If no candidate for mayor receives more than 50% of the vote in the primary election, then the two candidates for mayor receiving the highest number of votes cast by the electors at large shall be declared the primary nominees and shall be entitled to have their names printed on the ballot to be used in the general municipal election. So primaries matter. With that, let's get right to the opening question. And we'll begin with Anthony Cates. And the question is, so you would like to be mayor. Could you tell us a little bit about your background and yourself as a person? And we will have ample time later to explore your positions on issues. Yes, I am Anthony Cates. I am a 23-year-old young man. Um, pretty much my whole life has prepared me for this moment. Um, from when I was in elementary school, I was a part of the safety patrol. Where I, um, middle school, I was a mentor, tutor, a part of 500 role models. And what has grown to today's 5,000 role models, also where I mentor and tutor my peers. Going to high school, I was a part of student government. I had the opportunity and chance of meeting now presidential Barack Obama. Um, I have over several hundred community service volunteer hours with the Sixth Circuit Court Juvenile Arbitration Program. Um, also, I was part of the, the Young Alpha Males, which basically prepared to young men to be self-sustaining citizens in life and have great future <clears throat> endeavors. Upon graduating, I managed. Thank you very much. Mr. Christ. Good evening. My name is Rick Kreisman. Uh, my family moved to St. Petersburg in 1972, went to Azalea Middle School, Bogusiega High School, uh, went off to the University of Florida, and came back home to attend Stetson University College of Law, where I have, uh, I've now been a practicing attorney for the last uh, 26 years. Uh, I am married uh, to my wife, Carrie. We will be celebrating our 21st wedding anniversary this November. And we have two kids, my daughter, Jordan, who's 15, and my son, Samuel, who is 10. Uh, I'm honored to have served on the city council for six years. 
uh, serving as the chair of the council in 2005. I also served in the Florida uh, legislature uh, in the House of Representatives, uh, where I served my last two years as the policy chair uh, for the House Democratic Caucus. I also serve on the uh, board of the Heroes of the St. Pete Police, uh, was a member of the board of my temple for a number of years, uh, and I'm on the, currently on the board of Remember, Honor, and Support. Uh, and we put on the 9-11 uh, breakfast honoring our servicemen and women. Thank you. Thank you. Kathleen Ford. Hi, I'm <coughs> Kathleen Ford, and I am married to Harvey Ford. We've been married 32 years, and we have two children, Maggie and Drew. They are fourth generation St. Pete High Green Devils. Go Green Devils. And as many of you all know, my background first is in nursing. I graduated from the University of Virginia. And then while working full time as a critical care nurse, I went to night law school in Houston, Texas. Upon graduating from law school, I took a few bars. I'm licensed in the state of Texas, state of Florida, and the District of Columbia. I've had the privilege of serving as a council member here in the city of St. Petersburg, following my efforts at neighborhood improvements starting back in the late 80s. And as many of you know who have lived here for a while, St. Petersburg was far different. I'm very excited about the changes we've seen here. On a personal note, I love music, and I'm really looking forward to an opportunity to chat with you all tonight and learn a little bit more about what you think is important in the city. Thank you. Paul Jimmy. Good evening. And thank you for inviting me here. First, I raise the Bible because I place God before money, man, and government. This is my second time running for mayor. And tonight, I will answer these questions in conjunction with God and morality. Thank you. Bill Foster, please. Good evening. Thank you to USF St. Pete for moderating this occasion. My name is Bill Foster. My family moved to St. Petersburg in 1900. So I'm a fourth generation native of the city of St. Petersburg, a city that I love. Graduated from Northeast High School, Samford University in 1990, no, 1984, I'm sorry, 85, with a degree in public administration because I always wanted to be a city manager. Got my law degree from the Cumberland School of Law in 1988. I married my high school sweetheart and this past Saturday, we celebrated our 28th wedding anniversary. We have two children, one a recent graduate of the University of Florida. Uh, she is a registered nurse here in the state of Florida, moved back to St. Petersburg because she wanted to. My son is a new baby gator at the University of Florida. And uh, it's been a joy these past three and a half years to be the mayor of the fourth largest city of the state of Florida, St. Petersburg. Thank you all for your opening <coughs> comments. Our first question, we'll begin on our far left with Anthony Cates. The first question, the topic is on leadership style. To what extent is compromise considered a good day in the office? And where does compromise fit into your leadership style? Well, for us to lead as a, or to become a great city, we all have to make compromises. This is how we would get the bipartisanship of our office, although this is a nonpartisan race. We have to, <coughs> agree, we have to come together as one on all issues that we face as a city. And to be a great leader, you have to be willing and ready to listen and to make everyone or to include everyone as part of our advancements to advance our city of St. Petersburg, Florida. Thank you, Rick Reisman. Thank you. Uh, to me, leadership is about uh, being willing to take a position on issues, stand by your position, and advocate for your position. Uh, but equally, it's important to, to be willing to listen, to learn, and then to lead. And that means that uh, even though you may have a pre preconceived notion about a position that you want to take, you have to be willing to listen to, the op uh, to an opposing viewpoint. Uh, and if they make a compelling argument, uh, be willing to change that viewpoint. Uh, that's, that is compromise, and it is an important part of the democratic process. Thank you. Kathleen. <clears throat> 
It's interesting that you should bring up the issue of compromise because it's going to be so critical as we move forward here in the city of St. Petersburg. You know, it's been interesting to see how many folks have been so upset with this whole peer issue. And I think that's where had we started out letting all of the stakeholders have an opportunity to weigh in on this issue, we wouldn't be where we are today. I think absolutely compromise is important. And of course, being uh, an attorney and litigating, we are always figuring out how, how we can make things work because as most folks know, 90% of our cases settle. So we're always looking at how we can compromise because we know that litigation costs are so expensive. And the same is true when you're looking at problem solving. Get everybody to the table. Let's talk about what we can agree on and grow from there. And um, I would look forward to that opportunity. Thank you. Paul and Jimmy. I will answer this question <coughs> with a quote from the Bible. From the Gospel of Matthew, the sixth chapter. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Thank you. Thank you. Bill Foster. I think the art of compromise is an important quality in any leader, but you have to know where to take it, and you have to know when compromise becomes selling out. And one thing that during my administration I've been consistent is always making sure that the interest of the taxpayers of the city of St. Petersburg are never compromised. So uh, there's a big difference in forming an opinion uh, and, and staying by that even when objectives change and, and, and circumstances change. I think you know, the, the quality of, of compromise is knowing when to adapt, knowing when to adapt when circumstances change. And I, so I think the art of compromise uh, is a quality that we all have to have as leaders, but you have to know how far to take that. Thank you. This question will begin with Rick Kreisman. The topic is finding efficiencies in the city budget. Virtually every city across America has been forced to do more with less and to create efficiencies in service delivery to stretch tax dollars. Do you believe there are more efficiencies to be found in this city's budget if yes, where? Well, I, I think in every budget that you propose, you always ought to be looking for ways of finding efficiencies. Uh, it, it should be something that goes on uh, continuously throughout the year. I mean, it's, it, to me, it's not something that you do once a year. You should be uh, constantly looking at ways of being more efficient in the way you run your government. I also think there's opportunities uh, for collaboration and working with our partners, with, our, with Pinellas County, with the city of Tampa and, and our other surrounding communities at finding opportunities where in working together and collaborating, uh, potentially we can find efficiencies. Um, so, you know, <clears throat> I think it's something that we always continually have to do uh, and in these, uh, in the tough times that we're facing with this, the budget, we have to, we have no choice but to find efficiencies, but we need to look beyond our borders also and in, in for those opportunities. Thank you. Kathleen. Areas where I think we can look for efficiencies in our city budget is where we have folks who are doing singular duties rather than collaborating across lines and across uh, departments so that we have, rather than a silo effect, we have more coordination and I think we'll have better service that way also. Certainly I have always advocated for zero-based budgeting. I don't think we truly understand what the cost of particular services are and our fees and our taxes should be based on what that cost is. And I would advocate that we look at that because I think once we really get down to the nitty gritty of figuring out how much it costs to provide service, then we'll find some additional efficiencies. Certainly we can look at economies of scale with purchasing and I'm sure there's some of that going on, but I really see a need for better contract management to make sure that the citizens of St. Petersburg are getting all that they are entitled to and all that they paid for in the way of services and products. And I think another area that we can also look at is those big ticket items, for example, gasoline and fuel, which was a real budget buster way back when the prices were going up. So those are areas we can explore. Thank you. Paul can Jimmy. Okay, I <laughs> represent God, morality, and the common man. I don't represent greed, big business, and industry in dollars and cents. And I will answer this question simply by saying from the Gospel of Matthew, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's and render unto God the things that are God's. Thank you. 
Thank you. Bill Foster. I've been working on the budget almost continuously since the moment I was sworn in as mayor, and we're always looking for efficiencies in every single department. Something that Mrs. Ford talked about, zero-based budgeting, that's really a line-by-line -line <laughs> review of every single expenditure that we have in the city, and we've been doing that. We, we look for partnerships. We've established partnerships with the St. Petersburg Chamber, with USF St. Pete, with the school system, with the county, with the sheriff's department. We're always looking for ways where we can partner uh, so where, where, where we can get better, the best bang for the buck. We've looked at consolidations of departments and we've done that. We've consolidated numerous departments to make sure uh, that there are efficiencies there. Capital investments to decrease operating <coughs> expenses are something that we always look at, reducing that annual uh, expense. Uh, private sector, we've looked at privatization of certain aspects and we privatized departments, the part departments in our fleet and maintenance. Uh, as one example of where we're constantly looking for efficiencies through, uh, through technology, through partnerships, and through consolidations. Thank you. Question number three will begin with Kathleen Ford. Did Mr. I, I think, think I get it. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, <laughs> Anthony. Anthony. Don't okay. forget about me down here, Frank. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, yes, the budget is important. In order for us to be considered a global city, we have to, of course, for one, take a more fiscally conservative approach in every aspect. Um, and we have to do that by starting with the leader of our city. We, if elected mayor, I will be more than willingly to take a 53% pay cut to help fund all types of programs to help advance our city as a whole. Um, the budget must also include all citizens of St. Petersburg not just a targeted area or a targeted group. Everyone must be included and incorporated in this. Yes, there would need to be a line-by-line -line review. We do need more audits done to find out where all the money is being targeted towards or where all the money is going. This is something we must do to, in order to succeed as a city. Thank you, my apologies again. No problem, Frank. <laughs> Question number three, begin with Kathleen Ford here, and this is a write-in question from one of our audience members. It's on your job creation philosophy. As a guiding principle, are you one who is more likely to support incentives to attract one large company that promises to bring 100 jobs to our community, or 10 small businesses that promise to bring 10 jobs each? I'm more inclined to look at the smaller business model, but I would be certainly open to making sure that we have in place the infrastructure so that a larger company could come here. As you know, we have a vast amount of space in our industrial park, and I think there's some real opportunities there. And that's, frankly, why we set that up when we were all on council and gradually building our dome industrial park. I think with computers and the internet, our whole entrepreneurial model has changed, and I think we're far more likely to see more smaller businesses than larger businesses. That being said, with the medical and research and marine research industries here, there are some opportunities for some large-scale companies. But my general inclination is to look at creating the opportunities for more small businesses. Thank you. Paul and Jimmy. Okay, I do not represent greed, big business and industry. I represent the common man. I represent God and morality. And I'd like to also leave that with a quote from the 16th chapter of Matthew. For what shall it profit a man if he should gain the whole world but loses his only soul? Thank you. Thank you. Bill Foster? Well, the beauty is in St. Petersburg, we really don't have to choose. And I think, you know, as we look at relocating businesses or helping large businesses create high-paying jobs, that's a benefit. But we also, we also can work with small businesses to help them grow, to go from five to 10, or to create those new jobs. This city was founded on the backbones of small business. So in collaboration with the St. Petersburg Chamber of Commerce, we've created the greenhouse. USF St. Petersburg is a big part of that. And, and it's creating a system to where you remove all impediments to, to business, from starting a business, to growing a business, to relocating a business. The greenhouse is all about job creation <coughs> and teaching entrepreneurial skills to to our community. So the beauty in St. Pete, you don't have to choose. Uh, the greenhouse is up and running, and uh, it's all things small business, medium business, large business. By the way, it's called the greenhouse because you can plant a, you can plant a business, 
and grow it. You can take an existing business and make it even bigger. You can bring in other business and transplant right here. It's business gardening. Anthony Cates. Yay, I'm not forgot about this time. <laughs> um, I'm all about small businesses. Um, I had the opportunity of running a small business. My sister, who was a business owner, these are the citizens that need, need us most. These small businesses are our own citizens, our own neighbors right here from our city. Um, I'm, yes, it's good to bring larger businesses because they can employ our citizens by the masses. However, we do not need larger businesses that keeps our citizens at a poverty area or one paycheck away from being homeless. Businesses like Walmart, I'm all for, yes, they employ the masses. But at a minimum wage of $7.67 to employ our beloved citizens, no, I am not for that. Um, I'm all about small businesses, and we need more small business incentives on keeping our small business owners here in St. Petersburg. Thank you. Rick Kreisman. Well, you ask a question that's uh, something I've been very concerned about, and it's, it's the fact that we've had opportunities in this community to bring in small businesses uh, and, and locate them in the Dome Industrial, and instead we've turned them away, waiting for that bigger business to come. And I think that is a mistake. I would like to see us welcome those businesses, those small businesses, that we can then uh, grow in, into larger businesses. At the same time, though, we, we do need to be open to those big businesses and, and not uh, push them away at the same time. But uh, I think we have opportunities in marine sciences that we're not uh, fully exploring to the degree we can be. We have opportunities in healthcare that we haven't taken advantage of. Uh, and I'd like to see our technology and green business opportunities grow. Uh, and those are exactly the kind of businesses that you're describing when you're talking about small businesses. And the other thing with small businesses that you get uh, versus waiting for that one big one is when that big business leaves your community, you feel it. We felt it when Universal Healthcare left, as opposed to when one of those 10 leaves, it doesn't destroy our economy. Thank you. Question four, we'll begin with, with Paul Jimmy. This is another write in response from an audience member. It's on Homeland Security. The deadly bombings during the Boston Marathon this spring has again put cities on notice and sparked serious conversations about public safety, whether at high profile public events or securing major infrastructure facilities. How have situations such as the Boston bombing impacted St. Petersburg and our emergency planning and funding for major events? And what kind of broader community conversation should we be taking place regarding Homeland Security? Well, the only way I can answer that is that people have to have more love for their fellow man. Uh, and this is the answer right here. This is the book of truth. It's the only book of truth. That's the answer. And I will say from the Gospel of John, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Thank you. Thank you. Bill Foster, same question. <clears throat> Homeland Security. Homeland Security has evolved since 9-11. And Homeland Security is more than just a terrorist attack from a bomber. It's about protecting a water supply. It's about protecting a computer network. It's about uh, protecting a school, a raise game, an event in the park. So uh, understanding Homeland Security and having these relationships, the, the men and women of the St. Petersburg Police Department have done an outstanding job in training and experience and in relationships with other agencies. I will say that the exercise that we had with the Republican National Convention, the training, the equipment that we received in having to host an internationally recognized event uh, provided the city with uh, with incredible experience. But it's also having people at the top that understand that these relationships with federal agencies are indeed important. So um, yeah, Homeland Security, uh, with these relationships that we have and with the great men and women of the St. Petersburg Police Department, uh, I think our, our citizens are well served uh, with, the, with their experience and training. Thank you. Anthony. Yes, uh, this is a <coughs> simple answer. I will not give a response, but my answer is our police officers, they must be properly trained and ready for any situation. 
that will occur regarding our public safety. Thank you, Mr. Kreisman. Uh, thank you. I think we do have uh, excellent men and women who serve on our, both our police and fire uh, departments. Uh, and, and obviously we need to continue uh, with their education and training uh, for uh, emergency and natural disasters to be ready. Uh, but it also does involve coordination uh, with state and federal authorities and make sure that we have uh, processes in place. We know what, what steps need to be taken. We make sure we have uh, open lines of communication that are available in the, in, in, the, uh, in the event that communications get knocked out, how it is that we can communicate with our citizens. Uh, and regarding community involvement, I think a big part of that is education and having dialogue a continuing dialogue with our citizens, uh, particularly as we as we head into hurricane season. Uh, while while Homeland Security isn't necessarily oversee that, it's an important thing that we uh, we need to be concerned about in this community. Uh, we are always at risk every year, uh, so I think it's it's critical that we continue to keep our citizens informed, uh, what steps they can take to keep themselves safe, uh, and how to work with their city. Thank you, Mrs. Ford. Yes, back in 2000, the city of St. Petersburg, mainly our firefighters, had a wonderful uh, seminar on how we could prepare for weapons of mass destruction here in the city of St. Petersburg, looking at both nuclear, biologic, chemical incidences. And we did a pretty extensive survey of our resources and the potential targets. And like Bill mentioned, there's always the issue of Tropicana Field. And then, of course, you all know we've got an airport, we've got a port, we also have power companies, we have our own water treatment centers, and each one of those is a target. At that time, we had made a recommendation to harden those targets and make sure we had protective measures put in place. And for example, there are certain cameras now that are in place at these spots so that we can see and maintain our security. The cyber threat is always going to be out there, and I think as we learn more about it, we will be working more closely with DOD, ATF, and um, the FBI because early warnings will give us an opportunity to get prepared, and we definitely need to include the public. That, I think, is something we need to strengthen. Thank you. Moving on to question number five, we'll begin with Bill Foster. The title, It's a War Zone Out There. Last week during a city council primary forum, a question was asked regarding a one book, one city program working its way across the United States where a single book is suggested as a starting point to pull people together and to address community issues. One of the candidates running for District 6 suggested that St. Petersburg may want to consider Saving Private Ryan as a read, because as he went on to explain, it's a war zone out there in some of our neighborhoods. Whether or not this was an exaggerated soundbite in the heat of the moment, this comment still resonates at some level. As mayor, what will you do to address public safety in high crime neighborhoods? Well, we're gonna to continue to implement our city resources in areas of greatest need, and it's, and it's not just about Policing. We've we've got uh, the drop unit, the Coney unit. We've got we've got numerous specialty units within the city of St. Petersburg Police Department uh, that are constantly in high crime areas and things like that. But it's more than just those that wear, wear the badge. It is education. It is housing. It is using our city resources in these areas of greatest need to lift up the entire neighborhood. It's using our our monies for blight removal and for. Uh, housing renovations or, or neighborhood stabilization funds. It's using uh, other city resources like parks and recreation, sanitation, to make sure uh, that that we've, we're addressing the essential needs of the community. So, you know, with the community services department, uh, that Nike department, that their motto is to just do it. It's working with the police officers to go after not only the crime itself but the causes of crime, whether it's a a, uh, a SEPTED, crime prevention through environmental design, whether it's working with a crime watch group, these are the things that we're doing to combat crime in our neighborhoods. Thank you. Rick Kreisman. Well, you can't address crime uh, and high crime without addressing the underlying causes of crime. And when we're talking about that, we're talking about education. Uh, St. Petersburg schools, uh, was reported in the, in the Tampa Bay Times, uh, had been performing below uh, the other schools in Pinellas County, and that, that, can't, that can't remain that way. We have to change that. We've got to give kids an opportunity uh, to obtain employment when they leave and to, to know that they have an opportunity uh, to, to, to a career that's different than uh, the path of crime. We also have to focus on jobs and creating jobs in this community, and we haven't, and this administration hasn't been, uh, ha hasn't done 
done that effectively in the last three and a half years. Um, it's also important to have safe neighborhoods, and, and, and that's where our police come into play. Uh, I have said uh, fairly consistently that I have issues with uh, the fact that we've gotten away from community, traditional community policing. Uh, there needs to be that relationship between the officer and the neighborhood that, that used to exist that doesn't seem to exist in the same way it did before. Uh, there needs to be that trust. And if you do that, you help attack crime. Thank you. Kathleen Ford. Public safety in high crime areas, I think, does need to be addressed. And one way that I think we can begin to do this more effectively is by reinstituting community policing. We know if we get into the neighborhoods and get to know folks, we can anticipate some of those problem criminals or potential criminals and perhaps ward them off. And early intervention, I think, will prevent some of the juvenile delinquency and that is, ends up in tougher crime. And I think that's a, a commitment we need to make here in the city of St. Pete. We've got one of the higher clearance or lesser clearance rates in the area and I think if we work a little bit harder to solve those crimes, get those criminals off the street, that'll serve also to decrease the crime. And although the crime generally has gone down, we have seen in this year, 2013, that gradually it's been inching up in those areas and I, that is of concern to me and I am committed to reinstituting community policing. And then of course, I agree with Mr. Kreisman, we've got to look at education and I'm in favor of looking at preschool education because I think we have to learn, get our kids ready to go to school to be more effective when they are in school. Thank you. Paul and Jimmy, final word. Uh, we have long since lost a war on illegal drugs uh, the Drug Enforcement Administration knows this, and I think the people in America know this. Um, every community has a red light district. We have it here in St. Petersburg, 34th Street North. We have a string of motels with prostitution and narcotics going on. It's been going on for 60 years. Every community has the same problem. The reason what's behind it is corruption at the highest levels of law enforcement. People at the top are getting their palms greased. The top law enforcement officials in this country are getting their palms greased. That's why this, these drugs continue to come into this country. Too many people like money and, it, and this corruption. That's why we have lost the war on illegal drugs. Thank you, we have a 30 second rebuttal from Bill Foster. Well, the mindset that we don't have community policing in the city of St. Petersburg is erroneous. Traditional community, community policing, you have to understand what community policing really is. But going back to a failed model or, or that we're going to take some of our other officers that are doing very specialized work to combat crime in the city to put them uh, into a neighborhood, that's, that's simply old school. Community policing is changed through public engagement. It is relationships. It's making sure that we're on the neighborhood level and, and, and on the individual level to address the public safety issues that are there. So community policing is alive and well in St. Petersburg. Rick Kreisman, 30 second rebuttal. Yeah, and if, if you talk to the neighborhood associations, uh, I, unfortunately I think they'll disagree with Mr. Foster and the traditional community policing model has, is currently successful in cities all around the country. Uh, I did see the chief's comments in the paper regarding the fact it didn't work in St. Petersburg and quite frankly I think that's more a matter of the way it was implemented as opposed to the model itself. Kathleen Ford, 30 second rebuttal. Well, as a former neighborhood association president who worked closely with the police department in our past model, as with community police officers, we know they work. And that's why there's so much angst right now, as folks remember when we had our community police officers and how we were able to head off those problems. And it is still a tactic used throughout the nation. Thank you. Question number six, we come back around to Rick Kreisman. This is a write-in response from an audience member. The topic is thoughts on equality for lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender citizens, or LGBT for short. In a recent report entitled the 2012 Municipal Equality Index, published by the LGBT Human Rights Campaign, St. Petersburg scored a 46 out of 100 total points with respect to how well the city measured on a matrix of items such as non-discrimination laws, relationship recognition, city employer practices and guarantees, and municipal services and programs supporting LGBT initiatives. Tampa scores 20 points higher than St. Petersburg with a score of 66, followed by Miami with 72, followed by Orlando with 77. 
Perhaps not surprisingly, Jacksonville scored a 15. While not a perfect measure by any means, we can at least compare the progression of our cities towards full equality for gay and lesbian citizens. Where do you stand on full equality for members of the LGBT community? And are you satisfied with a score of a 46 for St. Petersburg? Um, no, I'm not satisfied with a score of 46. Uh, and I have a long history uh, with the LGBT community. Uh, I signed the first proclamation uh, back, I think it was in 2005, been involved with the community since I think roughly 1993. I suspect that Tampa maybe scored 20 points higher because their mayor walked in the parade. I don't know. but. We, we need to recognize the, the, the diversity that's in this community. We need to celebrate the diversity in this community. Uh, the LGBT community adds tremendous value to our community. Um, you, all you have to do is look at St. Pete Pride. Uh, and when we have 120,000 people that come visit us here in St. Petersburg and see what a great city we are. So I think there's a lot more we could, we could be doing. I'd like to see us doing more to market uh, around the country uh, to the LGBT community of, of what we have here in St. Petersburg. Uh, but yeah, we're, we're not coming close to what we could be doing. Thank you. Kathleen Ford. I am pleased that we're better than Jacksonville. I think obviously we can do better, but I applaud Mayor Foster and his initiatives to move our city forward with um, partners' benefits here in the city of St. Petersburg. I. I'm so pleased to see our whole nation moving forward. And it's a human rights issue, and no one should be discriminated against. And whatever we can do to move our community forward, I think it's important that our city lead. And um, there's more that we can do. Thank you, Paul and Jimmy. A reading from the book of Leviticus, chapter 18. You shall not lie with a man as with a woman, it is an abomination. If a man lies with a male as if he were a woman, both men have committed an offense, something perverse, unnatural, abhorrent, detestable. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. This is the word of God. Go Foster. St. Petersburg has come a long way. And I am proud of this city. I'm proud of everything that, that this city has done when it comes to recognizing domestic partnerships with the domestic partner registry. We have a zero tolerance policy in, in our employment and housing when it comes to domestic partners. And uh, under my administration, we extended domestic partner benefits for all employees. So. Um, in, in the gay and lesbian community. So we celebrate our diversity. Uh, we celebrate all of the gifts that the people bring to the table. And uh, I think the city is, is miles ahead of, of others. I, am I satisfied with any type of scoring? I don't, <coughs> I, I don't depend upon the scoring of others. I just know that uh, the city of St. Petersburg uh, truly celebrates its residents, all residents. Thank you. Moving on to question number seven, Kathleen Ford. The topic is historic preservation. How important is historic preservation in your vision of St. Petersburg? And under what circumstance might business development trump historic preservation? Well, I love historic preservation because growing up in Virginia, Yorktown, Virginia, Williamsburg, and Charlottesville, you would think that Thomas Jefferson and George Washington sat just about everywhere. But what it did give me was a real unique appreciation for our history, and that was one of the things that really drew me to the city of St. Petersburg and the Old Northeast and my early efforts at neighborhood preservation there, as we had some concerns that we would lose a lot of our wonderful old homes for big condo towers, and because there was some pressure there in the late 80s. And so I've worked closely with the St. Petersburg Preservation on various issues, and I think we can do more to recognize our historic homes, and we have some very committed volunteers who give fabulous tours of our historic buildings here in the city of St. Petersburg. And I think offering the tax credits makes it more easy, or makes it easier for some businesses to redevelop areas. And you know, I applied Chuck Prather and his group with uh, Birchwood. That was a real challenge to preserve that building. And of course, we have a process in place. 
to allow developers to redevelop. Thank you. Paul and Jimmy. Well, I'm 100% in favor of um, preservation of um, our city mo city's monuments or whatever, you know, we have in this city to share with, uh, you know, with the, the rest of the state. And uh, I agree 100% with Kathleen. And yes, I'm 100% in favor of uh, preserving all of our uh, landmarks, 100%. Thank you. Bill Foster? Well, if you don't preserve your history, you have no way to teach the future. And uh, so, I mean, we're going through the exercise now with the Detroit Hotel. And it's a balance because you have to balance the, the, the private property interest of an owner with their ability to develop versus uh, a, the, a, a true importance to a community to prever, preserve its history. And I, my motto with that is, it's the Detroit. So, I mean, these are things that we have to preserve. I'm proud of the African American Heritage Trail that we've started because, you know, that kind of came to me and going to funerals of great leaders and you hear all of these stories about the places they've been and the things that they did in the community and we were just losing that history. So we started the African American Heritage Trail and Gwen Reese is overseeing that project. And it's incredible because we're preserving the oral testimony and maybe there's not that landmark that's still there but there's the property there where things actually occurred. History is in, is in preserving the events and the time, at the times and the places uh, that are of, of great significance to our growth. So I'm very proud of what we've done with our historic preservation. Thank you. Rick Kreisman. You know, when you travel to cities all around the country, what typically strikes you about those that are thriving the most are the ones that have maintained their, their structures, their old historic structures. Because those are the structures that give the, the city its character and its texture. Uh, and that's what really makes it different from every other community. So I'm a, I'm a big supporter of, of historic preservation. I want to thank, since she's sitting here, uh, Council Member Curran. It, it's, it's ironic that we had a, uh, an area in the city on Central Avenue uh, right around 6th that was slated to be torn down. And because we got lucky, actually, when the, when the economy tanked, uh, Council Member Curran saw it as an opportunity. And now that's an area that's still there in, in all its glory, and it's thriving. And it's got great galleries and shops. Uh, and it has character. And that's what makes this community special. It's the character of these structures. So I think you do look for that balance, and you try, and, and whenever possible, uh, to uh, maintain the structures that you have and locate in the exi existing structures. Thank you. Hawk and Jimmy, moving on to question number eight. It's on Midtown Business Development. How might you as mayor continue to strengthen and support a vibrant Midtown Business District? Okay, we need to, uh, for one thing, um, get people, you know, p p young people need to be, you know, get education, get a good education and uh, go to school and, uh, um, you know, it'll give them more opportunities to uh, get better jobs, uh, things like that. But I'm, not, I'm not really uh, knowledgeable, really, about uh, that area. <laughs> Thank you. Bill Foster? Well, Midtown Redevelopment is very important, and it's been important since I've been mayor, and it was important under the previous mayor. And I supported the initiatives when I was on the city council for the Tangerine Redevelopment and redevelopment along the Deuces. And, and, uh, redevelopment in Child's Park and the Child's Park plan. So all of these things are very important. Going forward, I think as we work together with the community, with Agenda 2020, um, that, we, that we come up with this community redevelopment area and a plan that will allow us to invest not only tax increment financing money, which takes about 10 years to start that increment, but to work collaboratively with the county in a joint CRA to go after grant monies to infuse these monies into the Midtown community. Those monies could be CDBG, they could be housing money, neighborhood stabilization, project rebuild, uh, mortgage foreclosure, uh, the, the settlement monies that are now housed with the state of Florida. All of these things when you're working on restoring housing, blight removal, and incentivizing redevelopment into a community, these things will work. So uh, I've been working on that for the past three and a half years through a very great recession. We're seeing light at the end of the tunnel. We're coming out of it. Okay. Rick Kreisman. 
Uh, well, you know, I've, I've said this before. Uh, I, I would never criticize um, the mayor for hiring and firing decisions, but I do take exception to not replacing uh, the position that Goliath Davis held so that we had somebody whose focus was on Midtown and whose focus was on making sure that those businesses that, that are there are, are able to survive and to thrive and on attracting new businesses to that area. Um, the Agenda 2020 plan really sets out uh, a number of elements that include job creation, investments in, in creating jobs. It includes uh, improving education and it improves uh, health care. Uh, all of which are necessary if we're going to if we're going to change the climate uh, in Midtown and make the opportunity for development and for uh, bringing business in more viable. Thank you, Kathleen Ford. I think Midtown business development is important, and I think. We've got a good start with some of our uh, academic institutions. I'm excited about what Bill's done with St. Pete College to grow that particular area. Because we know once we bring in some of the um, institutions, nonprofits, at least we're bringing in potential new clients for the smaller businesses, the restaurants and shops that would come along. I think a critical part of a successful business district, any business district, is to have good public safety, and I think that's an area that is frankly lacking, and until we make it safe, it's a little bit harder for businesses to locate there, and there's a reluctance by some customers to patronize those shops. So I think a critical component is to make sure that we have good public safety. Of course, we need to look at micro lending, see what we can do to help um, new entrepreneurs get started. We've got some wonderful resources through our SCORE executives who are able to help new businesses forming. And then, of course, whatever we can do to remove the barriers for businesses trying to start in the city of St. Pete is very important. Thank you. Question number nine goes to Bill Foster. Major League Baseball is the topic. <laughs> now you get there. Now we get there. Wait till you hear the next question. How important is keeping the Rays in St. Petersburg in your overall vision of the city? And help us understand your position on how you would likely dialogue with the Rays owners going forward. Well, likely dialogue with the Rays owners, I've been doing that this past year. And uh, you know, really the conversation has evolved. I'm happy to say that we have a great relationship with the owner of the Tampa Bay Rays. Uh, last night's walk-off home run was spectacular, or not home run, but walk-off victory was great. Um, but the, the, the conversation has really evolved into what happens after 2027. If all we want is 2027, I'm convinced we have that. And I think they are too. Now, the issue is, do you want a 2028? Do you want a 2038? Do you want a 2048? You know, do you want this generational baseball to stay in Tampa Bay? So yes, we are sitting at the table. Uh, we know that Tampa will be a part of that discussion if we are looking at a long-term commitment post-2028. But um, how important is it to protect the interest of the taxpayers of the city of St. Petersburg? How, is it, how important is it to keep that contract in place? It is of the utmost importance. We're not compromising on the integrity of the contract, nor are we compromising on the interest of the taxpayers of the city of St. Petersburg. So uh, we're working together. We have a great relationship. We have a ways to go. Okay, Rick Kreisman. I think it's very important um, to the taxpayers of the city of, this, uh, of St. Petersburg, this team. Um, we all have invested a tremendous amount of our taxpayer dollars. We've invested our heart and soul into this team. Uh, and for the stadium to be built, a lot of people gave up their homes and their businesses for that stadium. Uh, so we are absolutely, as a community, invested into this team and into making it successful. Uh, as a business that's in the city, that's one of our duties, is to, to work with businesses to try and help them be successful if we can be. Uh, and I'm, I'm glad that that dialogue that the mayor spoke about is, is now happening. Um, I wish it had happened a while ago. We have to have good communication with these folks. They are our partners. And if we're not communicating with them, then we have no chance of helping them be successful. We have no chance of keeping them not only in our city, but in our region. Uh, and that is critical to our taxpayers. Thank you, Kathleen Ford. Don't we just love baseball? Boy, I think Joe Madden has that magic. It's been really fun to watch the Rays and the new ownership group has really worked hard. Uh, there are some issues with attendance, and I, we understand those pressures. I agree with Rick and Bill. We, citizens of St. Petersburg, have a significant investment in this team and in Major League Baseball here in the city of St. Petersburg. And I think it's really important that we do uh, understand what that commitment is. 
the dome isn't going to be paid off till 2025. There was some additional debt that was taken on. A lot of folks don't understand how expensive those operating costs are. So I think whatever is done, whatever discussion is made or takes place, has to be very considerate of the existing and continuing obligation that the citizens of St. Petersburg have with that outstanding debt. That being said, of course, we're always going to talk with our partners. But again, we have to keep in mind that it's really important to protect the citizens of St. Pete. Thank you. Paul and Jimmy. Yes, I'm 100% uh, in favor of keeping the, the raise here. My problem is with the ownership of the team. Uh, the owner of the team is always complaining that there's poor attendance. Well, uh, my advice to him is, number one, stop the greed. $5 for a hot dog, $5 for a soda, uh, $10 or $20 to park your car. I mean, how, how, are, how, is, how is the common man going to be able to take his, his family to a game when it's going to cost a couple of hundred dollars? So my, my uh, gripe is with the owners. Get rid of the greed. Lower the prices. You will fill the stadium with common people able to see games, and it won't cost a fortune. There's too much greed at the top. 30-second rebuttal, Mayor Fox. And, ju and just a point of clarification from something that w was said by another candidate. Uh, the state bonds run through 2027, so the Tropicana Field indebtedness won't actually be paid off until 2027. A bulk of the bonds and those secured by local financing and the tourist development tax will be paid off in 2016, but the state of Florida's obligation at $2 million a year won't be satisfied until 2027. Thank you. Well, you thought this question would never come? It has. The pier, <laughs> the lens. <laughs> if some of the pundits' crystal balls are correct and the citizens vote to stop the lens project, what would you advocate for next as mayor? Would a pier structure, regardless of the final design, remain a high priority in your vision of St. Petersburg? This goes to Rick Kreisman. My vision for the pier is really that of the citizens, and, and I was the first one when I, when I announced that I was opposed to the lens moving forward to announce how to move forward from that standpoint. Uh, and we take the task force recommendations that already exist and we're a product of 65 meetings, and you go out to the public and you seek additional input. I think what we need to decide, though, from that additional input and really get clear on is, is what is it specifically that the citizens of this community want the peer to do? What functions do they want it to do? Once you know what you want it to do, and that process should take three months, then we put it out to bid and we say, here's what we want you to create. Now, create us something iconic around what you want, what we as a community want it to do. That should come back within nine months and by 2015, at the end of that year, we should be able to have that structure completed. Thank you, Kathleen Ford. Oh, over a year ago now, when City Council was considering the uh, lens proposal, uh, I, there, you know, over 20,000 people had signed a petition wanting to vote on the pier. So I thought it was prudent at that point in time that we put all the possible choices out there and let the citizens of St. Pete vote, rather than spend millions of dollars on something that may not pass. Now, City Council followed the mayor's direction. We were going along for months and years with a proposal to rehab the inverted pyramid and then suddenly it was taken off the table and there was a resolution to demolish the inverted pyramid and then that's when everybody got so upset. So I think council did exactly what the mayor directed him to do. Unfortunately, it's not what the citizens of St. Pete wanted. Going forward, I think we absolutely should ask the citizens of St. Pete whether they would like to renovate the existing inverted pyramid within the $50 million budget. And you know, there's an architect, Ken Kroger, who has come up with a rendering that shows what we could do with the existing inverted pyramid. And by simply narrowing the peer approach, we could rehab that peer under $50 million. Paul and Jimmy. Uh, we the people, that's in the United States Constitution, we the people, and the, the people of the city should have had an opportunity to vote on the fate of the peer. However, I believe that the $50 million that was allotted to try to save the pier four years ago 
could have been put to a better use. Um, there are so many people who don't have any medical insurance. There, was a, there are a lot of people who are poor, who don't have anything. Uh, I have, a, have an idea of uh, if I should be fortunate enough to be elected, I would host benefits to raise money to build a charity hospital for those with no medical insurance. I, I think we need that more than we need a new peer. Bill Foster? I think the question was, will it be a priority? And absolutely it will. This waterfront <coughs> is a prior priority. One thing that, that I learned, I have to talk fast, we only have a minute, but one thing that I learned throughout this process is the people of St. Petersburg want to peer, a peer, and they're passionate about their waterfront. So rather than talk about what we're going to do, we're already doing it. I assembled the 828 Alliance, which is to be prepared for August 28th, that, that we'll have this mandate from the people. Thank goodness they have a chance to vote. But this group is meeting now to come up with a process for the design and selection of a peer in the event the referendum actually passes. So this is a, a group of community, of, of residents, of pro-lens, anti-lens, marine scientists from, you know, Jackie Dixon from USF, Bill Hogarth, uh, peer, peer visioning task force members, architects, working together to come up with a process for the design and selection of a peer. But on August, on August 2 of 2012, I actually agreed with Kathleen Ford and proposed four questions for the city council to put on the presidential ballot because it was November, presidential election, you get a mandate, and the city council refused. So thank goodness the person that did the second petition drive did it right. Thank you. Question number 11, the topic is taxes, and this goes to Kathleen Ford. Is there anything so valuable in the city that you would, might be willing to take a stand that we might need to increase taxes to support? Today, right now, no. Paul and Jimmy. Not knowledgeable enough about it to talk about it. Bill Foster. We've done, we've done very well in the city of St. Petersburg over the last few years. We actually had a decrease in FY 2011 and in FY 2012. Uh, we had a millage rate increase with a tax increase uh, in 2013, and we've, were, I've proposed a balanced budget going forward uh, with a slight decrease in the millage rate. And the council has an opportunity to, uh, to actually come down from the millage rate that we had last year. But we won't play games with the numbers as far as a tax increase. We are not proposing a rollback rate, and it's very complicated. But there will be a slight tax increase going forward, but we're not increasing the millage rate, but we're hoping that with this infusion of money with tax growth, that we'll be able to provide for the increased cost of providing essential needs services to the people of the city of St. Petersburg. Thank you, Rick Kreisman. I think anytime you're looking at the city budget, you are uh, looking for ways to uh, get revenues with, without having to increase taxes, whether it's through grants, uh, or public-private partnerships in order to pay for programs that are important to the community, programs like uh, enhancing summer job opportunities for kids uh, or the investment in the 2020 Agenda 2020 plan. So uh, my, my initial response would be no, I certainly uh, would not like to raise taxes if not possible, um, but at the same time, I think it's uh, foolhardy for, to, 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 to put an absolute on, on that answer. Um, it is a last resort. Um, it was something I would try and avoid. Thank you. Paul and Jimmy, question number 12. It's on the arts in St. Petersburg. St. Petersburg has once again been recognized as the leading arts destination among mid-sized cities in America by American Style Magazine. Do you believe the city is doing enough to nurture and support the arts, especially individual artists in the community? Please elaborate. Well, I... I, I being from New York, I know how important the art community is. Uh, of course, uh, it was tremendously popular up, you know, up in up in the city in New York. Uh, uh, do I think it's doing enough? It, I, I think there's some wonderful galleries uh, in downtown St. Pete. Uh, unfortunately, I haven't been to very many of them, but uh, I support the cultural and art community 100%. That's what I can say about that. Thank you, Bill Foster. Well, two of the greatest treatises of, of city management that I read when I took office was For the Love of Cities by Richard Florida. And 
uh, no, I'm sorry, The Rise and Fall of the Creative Class by Richard Ford, and then For the Love of Cities by Peter Kagiyama. And it talks about these love notes that, that you can do and, and the importance of the arts and culture in a city. And I'm proud that under my three-year term, we have been rated number one as a destination for art and culture uh, because it's so important. It's so, it's so important to create these quality spaces in the city because people can live anywhere, but where they, where they have these respites, where they can go and enjoy performing arts, visual arts. I'm also proud a few years ago to have worked with Hank Hine at the Dolly Museum to assemble the last $5 million with the county uh, so we could finish that project. The Dolly is a tremendous asset for the city of St. Petersburg. Now, directly to the question, have we done enough? No, and I've been proposing with the city council, and hopefully we'll get this done someday, to nip at some of that wiki-watchy money so we can provide an endowment for the arts so we can continue the, to ride this wave of arts for the city of St. Petersburg. Mr. Kreisman. You know, it, it's the arts that differentiates us uh, from every other community in this in the state of Florida. Uh, you know, there's always a fear when we talk about regionalization and, and trying to work uh, collaboratively, collaboratively with uh, our friends across the bay that we're gonna lose our identity, but we won't because we have the arts here in St. Petersburg uh, and it is what we've become known for. Are we doing enough? No, we could be doing a lot more than we are. I would like to see us have more public art uh, throughout not just the downtown area, but the entire city. Uh, we have opportunities with a burgeoning music musician community, um, and we could have a, a reputation around the country for our, our local musicians, and we're not giving them an opportunity that we could be giving uh, to them uh, to feature them in, in this community. I'd like to see us doing more in that respect. And I don't think we're, we're investing enough in the arts community. Uh, and what we know from the studies that have been done, that when you invest in the arts, uh, the money comes back into your community multiplied. So I think there's a lot more we can be doing. Kathleen Ford. I really love the direction that the city's going in. And as a former bassoonist and string bass player, I have concerns about our Florida orchestra. I know that they need more money. And, and I'm so grateful for the musicians who have taken those cuts in pay so that we could still have an orchestra. But we do need to do more. And. I am just thrilled with the visual arts that we've had, and gosh, the international recognition for the Dali is just stunning. It's our number one attractor for international visitors here in the city of St. Petersburg, all of Pinellas County, and I think that's magnificent. We can do more. We've got our local artists, though, that we really need to be mindful of, and I'd like to see us incorporate more of our local artists in all of our public projects. When we're looking at a bathroom, is there a different way that we can incorporate an artist for that design? When we're looking at a sidewalk or signage, is there a way that we can incorporate our artists and give them a meaningful wage in order to continue with their more artistic or creative side? We could work that way together. Thank you. Two more questions. This one goes to Bill Foster. Topic is public schools. This is actually a writing question. Knowing full well that the mayor does not have direct oversight of our public schools, what can you do as mayor to facilitate the myriad challenges facing our public schools, not the least of which is the achievement gap between minority and majority populations? Well, the mayor has, has really, the, 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 especially the mayor of St. Petersburg, has the number one bully pulpit for Pinellas County, and it's working with the school system. And I've had three superintendents of schools since I've been mayor, but we, we have a good one. Michael Grego is dedicated. Uh, to the education of our children, but it's making sure that you build these partnerships to get the resources, not just in money, but in teachers, in, 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 in software, and in some of the educational programs, getting that money south of, of Almerton Road to make sure that our teachers are equipped to teach our children. And so with, with St. Pete's Promise, and it's not a rehash of anything that was previous. Yes, we have mayor's mentors and more. We're still going to, to do Top Apple. We're still going to raise money for doorway scholarships because it's successful. You've got a 93% graduation rate. But it's making sure that we have these relationships, these employees in City Hall that work for the school system, to make sure that we have the data, to make sure that we can track these students and, and, and trace them or encourage them into vocational training or college bound to make sure that they actually get that certificate, that education that they need. So at the end of the day, they get a quality living wage job. Thank you, Rick Reisman. You know, I talk about education a lot when I've been campaigning and people always say, well, how can the mayor have an impact? 
And, and all you have to do is look back uh, at the term of Mayor Baker, and uh, you see that the mayor can have a significant impact on education through it being innovative and creating the Mayor's Mentors and More program, uh, creating partnerships between businesses and our local schools so that funding, additional funding over and above that which the schools receive from the school system was brought in so teachers weren't having to reach into their pockets to pay for things. Uh, but it goes beyond that, and, and I think we can change the environment of the classroom. Uh, and that's one thing that you see in fundamental schools is, is a good environment through something called service learning. It's something I'd like to see in every one of our schools in Pinellas, in St. Petersburg. It takes community service, it integrates it into the curriculum, and in those communities that have done it, they've seen increases in graduation rates, decreases in behavioral problems, uh, and increases in grades of students. It can make a difference. Apprenticeship programs are also real important. We can make a difference in our schools here in St. Pete. Thank you, Kathleen Ford. I think our relationship with our public schools is very important. I think the city of St. Petersburg can do more in a different area, though. And I would like to see the city focus its resources on early child learning, childhood learning. It's a shame that our community lost $2.4 million that had to be returned because we couldn't get enough of those kids qualified for those dollars. We know that up until third grade, children are learning to read. After that, they read to learn. And we already know that some of our kids are struggling. I think that's too late. I think the city of St. Petersburg could initiate early childhood education, work collaboratively with our existing recreation centers and the existing preschools that we have out there in the city to make sure that all of our kids are ready to go to school in kindergarten. We can start getting them ready so that they are not behind. And that's been a problem and I think a good part of the gap. And I like the service learning idea, but some of these kids don't have, they come to school for free breakfast and free lunch because they are just so under so many pressures. And I think that's where our city can help out. Thank you. And Jimmy. Okay, I spend a lot of time at the St. Petersburg Public Library and I get to speak to a lot of young people that are 16, 17, 18 years old and some of them are on their way to college. I ask these kids common knowledge questions about American history. For example, I ask them, do you know who Dwight Eisenhower was? Do you know who Harry Truman was? Do you know who Lyndon Baines Johnson was? They all look at me and they say, I never heard of them. These are kids that are going into college and they don't know who our former presidents were. This is ridiculous. It's appalling. The education system is terrible. Uh, as mayor, I would, I would, I would definitely uh, talk to uh, the education commissioner of the state of Florida and put. Uh, American history into into our schools and kids should know these answers and they don't. Uh, I mean, it's ridiculous. Thank you. The final question. I have students in front of me helping out tonight, students behind me helping out tonight. And so it's about advice to students. Given that this debate is being supported and sponsored by USF St. Petersburg and our students, what advice do you have for students who are thinking that they too may want to get more involved in public service and politics in the future? And this question goes to Rick Kreisman. Wow. Um, don't do it. No, kidding. <laughs> uh, no, I, I think it, it's wonderful. Uh, we, we need our kids, we need our students, we need our young people to become involved. Um, you know, if, you're, if you are seriously interested in getting in, involved in public service, uh, the first thing you need to do is get involved in your community. Volunteer uh, in organizations. Uh, get involved in the city government. There are boards in, that you can serve on so that you learn how the city functions uh, and, and, and what you can do to make a difference. Mentor, mentor another child. And, and so you have an understanding of how you can have an impact on one person and then take that experience so that you can impact a broader community. Um, we need good young leaders uh, coming forward. So I'm, I'm actually really happy to hear that question. Uh, and, and I'm sure all of us up here that are sitting up here would be happy to talk with any of you at any time about our experiences and to share what, what we know on a personal level uh, and, uh, and try and address what direction you want to take your career. Thank you, Kathleen Ford. Welcome, come on in. You know, 
I don't think you're ever too young to really get started in politics. And my daughter, I'll tell you, she was here when she was four years old, typing on the typewriter while I was in here. Mom was speaking about some issue in the neighborhood. And I, my kids have been involved. And, and I think that's where it begins. You're, you're a citizen of the city of St. Petersburg, state of Florida, United States of America. And it's your obligation to be involved. And for a democracy, we need an educated populace to make those very important decisions because there's so much out there that can confuse, distract, and frankly, not give you all the facts that you need in order to make a decision. And I think early participation makes you aware of those particular factors that are involved so that you are better able to sift through and figure out how you can make a difference. Uh, we welcome your involvement. It is important. We need an educated populace for our democracy to succeed. Thank you, Paul and Jimmy. Okay, um, my advice to young people who are interested in getting into politics is that first, you have to have a love of humanity and people and um, care enough about them to want to change things, to try to make things better. Uh, my friend Anthony Cates, he's only 23 years old, and, and he's a perfect example of this. He and I are, have become friends over the last couple of months. And um, if, you, if you do want to get into, the, into public life, do it to serve humanity, but not to, to worship the dollar. Do it for the, for the, for the good of man, not for the good of of, of your bank account or for the good of, you know, personal wealth. You know, I, I talk about doctors who are more concerned about public health than personal wealth, and that's what I recommend to young people. Thank you. Bill Foster? Well, the greatest example is, is sitting right in front of me, the president <coughs> of USF St. Pete, the student body. And we've spent some time together, and I've observed you, and I think you have that servant's heart, and that's really the advice I would give to anyone that wants to go into public service. Don't go into politics. Go into public service and advocate for your constituents and, and, and learn this phrase. Memorize it and, and tattoo it on your arm. It's not about me. It's about the people. And I think the greatest public service that, that one can have is in city government because every decision that we make, whether it's on the city council or as mayor, impacts our residents on a day-to-day -day basis. It impacts public safety, it impacts water service, water treatment, parks and recreation, programs, social services. It impacts our residents every single day. And you don't have that impact when you're involved in partisan politics in Tallahassee or in Washington. But where the rubber meets the road, public service on the local level. And you've been a great servant and I've seen some of your colleagues over there Keep doing it, but remember, it's not about you. Let's stick with you, uh, Mr. Mayor. We have 90 seconds for closing statements, and you draw the first number. Well, thank you for USF St. Petersburg and your involvement in the community. It's been an honor to be your mayor for the past three and a half years. And my role as mayor is to oversee the day-to-day -day operations of the fourth largest city in the state of Florida, to be a steward of hundreds of millions of dollars and to oversee over 2,700 employees with one goal in mind, and that is to provide essential need services. And it's been an honor, and I'm running for re-election to build on our successes that we've had. You know, my vision four years ago was to create environments that were conducive to, to private investment, to create public safety environments and these quality spaces that would encourage people to want to invest in our community. And I'm happy to say that that plan has worked. We're on track for $450 million to $500 million in new development going on right now. It's the return of the crane. So going forward, and I'm, I would be honored to receive your vote on August 27th, but I will con continue my emphasis on public safety, economic development, job creation, neighborhoods, yes, education, which is key to the future success, intergovernmental relationships with Pinellas County, all of these things, we will continue to ride this wave. This is the first wave I've had since being mayor, but you know what? The city is on the right track. I've been serving you continuously since 1998. I don't come around every four years, 
or I don't come down from Tallahassee with failed policies asking you for your support without a plan and a vision. We have a vision going forward. Let's ride the wave together. Thank you. Talking Jimmy. Yes, um, I appreciate you inviting me here tonight. Um, I represent God, morality, and the common man. I do not represent greed, big business and industry, and dollars and cents. This is the only book of truth. If you elect me mayor of this city, I will fight immorality with morality. Thank you. Kathleen Ford. Thank you. Boy, St. Petersburg is such a wonderful city, and it's been amazing to watch all the changes over time since the very first neighborhood association meeting I was involved in in 1987 to form our very first neighborhood plan to see all the plans that have come about and to see how our business districts are taking on some of those same um, planning strategies in order to encourage more reinvestment in our community. That being said, I think we can tune up a few things. I think we need to really recommit to our neighborhoods. That is the lifeblood of our community. Our city is made up of our neighborhoods. And I think we need to restore our community policing because we can get ahead of some of those criminal problems before they become crimes. And I think we've got to commit to helping our kids succeed. And that means we've got to look at early childhood education so that our children are ready to participate in our public schools. And then, of course, work with our public schools and our wonderful academic institutions, including USF, at finding the special niche for our kids so that they can be successful adults with a livable wage. I think that's really important. Then, of course, we have to be looking at our seniors and our veterans who are coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan and have some incredible injuries. I think we have to make sure that we are prepared to honor and protect those who have served our community. And meanwhile, let's look at all the wonderful assets we have and grow each and every one. I ask for your vote on August 27th. Thank you. Rick Kreisman, final word. Thank you. For, for six years, I was honored to serve on the city council here in St. Petersburg. And for the last six years, I served in the state house in Tallahassee. I decided not to run for re-election uh, because Tallahassee is a place where common sense and good ideas no longer seem to matter. I wanted to come back to a place where people and policy was more important than partisanship. And that's particularly true in local government, and it's really true here in St. Petersburg. And for six years, I served with Mayor Rick Baker. He was a Republican, and I was a Democrat. Even worse, he was FSU, and I was UF. But even though we had differences, we never let our differences stop us from moving the city forward, because that's really what it's about. It's moving the city forward. It's about addressing the big issues that still haven't been addressed yet, but not forgetting about all the other issues that make cities great, like strong neighborhoods, uh, good public schools, uh, good safety, uh, and quality jobs. Uh, you know, I'm running for mayor uh, not because uh, I, I want to maintain the status quo, and I'm not running for mayor because I want to point out everything that's not working or to turn City Hall upside down. I'm running for mayor because I want to lead this, lead this city forward. Being mayor is about being proactive and innovative. Uh, it's about being a unifier, and it's about listening, learning, and leading. We've, we live in a very extraordinary community, uh, and I'm really excited about the future of our city, but I'm more excited about what the city can be. And I ask for your vote on August 27th to help lead the city forward. Thank you. Thank you. We show our appreciation to all of the candidates tonight. Thank you. Finally, one moment. If you'd like to watch this primary form again in its entirety, you have several options. You can tune into St. Pete TV for replays. You can go to the city's website at www.stpete.org. You may watch it on St. Pete TV's YouTube channel. In closing, I would like to thank our students, our faculty, and the members of the city of St. Petersburg for helping to facilitate this forum. Thank you all very much. Have a great night. Bye -bye.